How's everyone doing? Good. Just curious if this is uh, who here is this your first DEF CON? Oh. Oh, look around. Um, for those of you who this is your first DEF CON, welcome. Welcome. Um, each and every year, well, except for last year when we run talks, I ask this question, and the numbers are usually anywhere between like 70 to 80 percent. Uh, so the numbers are pretty consistent. So for those of you, if you're, you know, this is your first DEF CON, welcome. Um, it can be a little overwhelming, uh, let's be honest about it, but my biggest advice is um, take every opportunity that you can. This is an opportunity for you to learn as much as you, as much as you can. And also do yourself a favor, learn from other people, including strangers here as well too. Okay, you may never, never know that person that's gonna be, that you speak to, that could be a, a lifelong connection. Actually speaking of, speaking of, the next speaker, and talk about lifelong connection, that's how I gotta meet you. And uh, you'll be on in two minutes, so. Make sure you enjoy DEF CON and uh, learn as much as you can. Get started. Hello, everyone. Good now. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to DefCon 31, and welcome to talks uh, presented by the Packet Hacking Village. Since 2013, been a long time. Uh, the Packet Hacking Village has presented a track of talks. So and the whole premise is people who go to a talk uh, and you walk away, you should be able to take away something uh, immediately to use after the talk. So that's the whole premise of Packet Hacking Village Talk. And each and every year they're well attended and uh, first want to say thank you. Thank you for, for being here for actually our final Packet Hacking Village Talk for today. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce someone who has given a few talks in the past and quality world-class talk to the Packet Hacking Village for years, Mike Rago and Chet Hosmer. Um, so I'll let Mike give a little background about, uh, about him. Uh, and his talk is on open source uh, uh, intelligence. Okay, open open source intelligence and uh, physical physical threat intelligence. So, my pleasure to introduce an old friend, Mike Rago. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ming. Really appreciate it and super excited to be back. Uh, thanks for having me and huge shout outs to the Packet Hacking Village uh, for everything they do over the years. My name is Mike Rago. Um, my uh, good friend Chet Hosmer uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, some family related stuff. We wish him well, send our thoughts and prayers. Chet and I uh, co present quite a bit at a variety of conferences around the world. So uh, we share a lot of the same uh, information in terms of our research and uh, look forward to sharing that with you. 
This particular research and title of this presentation is OSINT for Physical Threat Intelligence. We know that a lot of people uh, in the security community today are leveraging OSINT intelligence in a plethora of ways, uh, whether it be for a person of interest or an organization of interest, whether it be for pen testing and going out there and gathering any public information they can find. Our particular focus of research for the last few years is physical threat intelligence, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what it applies to in the real world and how organizations and people use this today. So Chet and I, as I mentioned, have collaborated for many years. We've written books together, and we both have been professors with the University of Arizona, aside from our full-time jobs. And it's been a great resource ground for a lot of the things we do over the years. Furthermore, we've presented at a variety of conferences, including DEF CON, HACK CON in Norway, and many other conferences. In addition, a lot of this research we collaborate on um, allows us to work with a lot of organizations and understand a lot of their needs. So as we go through this, there'll be a lot of applied aspects and real world scenarios in how we use this physical threat intelligence for situational awareness. Chet has authored even more books than I have. And again, uh, just a, a variety of research over the years. In addition, uh, he does a lot of coding and runs pythonforensics.org. So Chet does a lot of research and a lot around Python. So I think most of us here are familiar with open source intelligence or OSINT. Again, what we're trying to do here is apply that wealth of information to meaningful intelligence that we can apply in a physical way whether that be concerns around business risk. Are we building a store in you know, a foreign country and are we concerned about someone targeting that store either while it's being built or the first day it opens with some kind of flash mob that destroys the store or things like that. Or maybe it applies to um, an organization that provides uh, help for people around the world. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Maui and everything that's occurred there, but there's a wealth of data and pictures and information people are posting that can be leveraged to determine where to mobilize help next and really provide that help to people that are in need. So this data can be applied in a variety of a lot of ways. Furthermore, it can be very cutting edge in terms of collecting it in a streaming format or live, so it can be very actionable. We'll talk about the overwhelming wealth of data out there and how to better curate that so you don't spend 99% of your time trying to find those needles in the haystack that are most helpful for situational awareness, but actually flip that model upside down to pre-curate that data and make it far more actionable in a very timely manner. As we mentioned here in the slide, we also want that to be a key uh, decision-making uh, piece of information that we can use. But it doesn't displace information you may receive via private channels or other channels you have and how you collect that intelligence and use it for situational awareness. Bottom line, it's meant to complement that data. The applied aspects of it could be related to threat assessments and business risk. Could also be related, as I mentioned, to disaster response. In this particular talk, we expose a lot of the research we've done around the Ukrainian war to actually identify different attack patterns, paths that troops are moving, what things are being destroyed, how to profile tanks and other uh, equipment out in you know, the Ukraine and other areas. And it also can be used in um, more uh, geopolitical type situations as well. So this data is becoming more and more helpful, but again, one of the big concerns may be around misinformation and disinformation, and we'll talk about that too. Lastly, before we get into how we actually perform this and some of the Python scripts we've created for the collections in weeding through that data is, as I mentioned, can we trust this data? One of the things that we do 
is by collecting it in a live and streaming format, but furthermore, pinpointing a geo and collecting what we call ground truth for a bounding box or a radius from which those posts are emanating from, we're not collecting data from around the world. We don't want data from around the world. It's littered with misinformation and disinformation. So you can leverage a technique that we'll talk about more here shortly, where you can create a radius or a bounding box around a city such as Kiev within the Ukraine. You could do it around a, an area that you know has been impacted by an unfortunate disaster. This will give you much more legitimate posts that are, again, originating from that area, giving you that ground truth. And we have found, bottom line, that that data is increasingly helpful and weeds out more than 99% of the misinformation. So in getting to what we mentioned earlier about being proactive and pre-curating that data so you don't have a huge data warehouse of useless data, this is one of the preliminary things you can do so you don't end up in that scenario. So let's talk about the trade craft and then we'll talk about our research and a lot of the interesting findings. So conducting this involves a lot of data sources. It may be social media, it may be other sources as well. And understanding the chemistry of these different social networks and other mediums that provide this information. For example, if you're gonna take a look at Discord, on Discord there are a variety of servers and channels that are focused on the Ukrainian war, that are focused specifically on nothing but tanks and other things that people are passionate about that they're posting. A lot of those posts are also non-biased, so there are pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian posts going on. But again, we want to collect ground truth, so we want stuff originating from that area, not across lines, not from other portions of the world. In addition, that helps with countering all that counterintelligence, misinformation and disinformation. So when we perform these analysis techniques, we also are profiling and understanding which of these accounts over time are actually spreading misinformation. We'll talk about how we profile those so that we understand the top uh, um, posters or people that may be posting legitimate information from that ground truth and people who are um, basically muddying the waters with that misinformation. So in this case, we want less data, not more. Most people will get on social media, leverage a hashtag or a keyword, and just start collecting a whole ton of data. If you talk to anyone that basically takes that and tries to automate that, there's just so much data collected, you end up spending too much time analyzing all that data. You can actually get ahead of the curve in a variety of ways. Also, you know, as a long time ago when I started out as a Unix system administrator, you know, my boss told me, listen, there's a lot of things to manage here on the network at the NASDAQ stock market. You know, laziness breeds efficiency. Focus on the most important things. You know, try to focus on, you know, uh, less data, not more, in how we uh, pre-curate that. So we'll talk about that too. Also, we want to respect the terms of service. These vary based on the website, based on the social network. Make sure you're familiar with what those are. Some of them have very important privacy policies where you're not supposed to expose the accounts from which this data may be coming from. Also, scraping and other things sometimes are not allowed. But as you interact, for example, with these social networks, there are exposed APIs. For example, with Twitter, those have changed quite a bit recently, and now also there are tiers you have to pay for to get some of that data that otherwise with a free account you wouldn't get. So understanding that too is going to help enrich your data and also ensure that you're within the terms of service. So, as we collect based on a different methodology, rather than keyword or hashtag, we actually collect by geo, again, we get that ground truth, data that's emanating from within that particular radius or bounding box. In addition, it increases the authenticity of it, because we're collecting not only posts, but we want those images, videos, and even emojis. 
And we pump those emojis actually through some ML that actually helps us in an automated way understand the sentiment too, which also helps us determine whether or not this information can be trusted. So we created a Python script that allows us to perform this collection. This allows us to either pick from a particular city or location and select the bounding box or radius for that location. Or you can actually put in the latitude and longitude and then define the radius or bounding box for which you want to collect. That fundamentally performs the collection by basically eliminating all the rest of the data from around the world. Are we going to miss a few important things? Yeah, but what I will say, that's a lot easier than collecting data from all around the world and trying to find those needles in the haystack. Instead, we're weeding out all those needles and we're getting roughly 90% of them. And that is far more actionable and timely in terms of leveraging this data for all of those applied aspects we mentioned earlier. We can additionally um, put in keywords and hashtags even in other languages and this will help further curate a lot of that data. There may be stuff within uh, a radius around Kiev that have nothing to do with the war. So if we're looking to collect stuff related to the Ukrainian and Russian war, there may be stuff that's irrelevant. As we perform the collection then, we're collecting each post. It could be a tweet, it could be a post, it depends on the social network, and collecting those images and collecting those videos. We'll talk next how that stuff is really important for cross-correlating that data. We also take a look at the accounts that are posting this information. So as we categorize them and determine who are the top people that are posting legitimate and very helpful information, we can actually focus on those and eliminate a lot of the other accounts. What we have found is of the data that normally emanates from a bounding box, that there are about 10 to 20 people that dominate those posts with a wealth of positive, helpful information, but there are also about 10 to 20 that are littering it with misinformation. But again, knowing these from the get-go, as you're collecting this data and weeding that out, again, helps curate the data in a very automated way. So we've gone, we've collected the data, we've done this in a very automated fashion, again, leveraging geolocation information um, and leveraging this in a chronological way um, so that you know, we have a timeline as well of the events and we can use this for predictive analysis. So let's talk about how we leverage this data. Now as we look through the data, we can see all the posts, all the tweets, and furthermore, any of the information and referring links. If it may point to uh, Twitter, if it may point to Discord, if it may point to Telegram. And as we look through the data that we've collected, we start to find some really interesting information. If you're using some form of computer vision uh, in your favorite cloud vendor, you can automate the analysis of these images, and we've done that. So if you're using optical character recognition, you may start to notice here on the screen that there are serial numbers on these military vehicles. And by knowing we collected that information for that vehicle, at that location, at that point in time, we know that that vehicle was located there. But if we're monitoring multiple locations around the, U the Ukraine, for example, Kikarev that they targeted first, then moved on to Kiev, if we saw that military vehicle in Kikarev and then later Kiev, we're starting to see a motion on the map, right, of where, these, uh, where this equipment is going, where the troops are going, and potentially where they may go next really interesting sliver of information I'll show you later that was something that we found that we completely did not expect. So there's a lot of related data here across these devices. If you're using optical character recognition, whether it be an image or a video, it'll go ahead and scan all those images and it actually gave us chronologically in time and location wise where, those, where that equipment was. And you may, have, uh, you may or may not have heard the terminology then chrono-locationally. So we're taking a look at it chronologically but also locationally as well. 
so, uh, kind of a new term that's been floating around chronolocationally. So to recap before we, get, we delve deeper into the data is we're performing live streaming collection, secondly, by geo to help pre-curate that data. We're not running a vacuum and collecting data from all around the world based on a keyword or hashtag. We're not doing that from the get-go. We're saying we want ground truth from this radius, from this location. In addition, since we're getting the location information, we can plop this on a map. One of the frequently asked questions we get is, how are you getting the location information then if that privacy is shut down or people don't have that enabled on their mobile devices when it's posted? It comes from the APIs and how these social networks are collecting the data. They know that it's been posted from within that bounding box. They won't say that that person is specifically on this street, on this corner in Kiev or San Francisco or Chicago or wherever, but it's definitely within that region. And in this case, we don't care exactly where it's pinpointed on the map. We can build a one mile radius around a region and get all that ground truth from there. And that's good enough for making these very important decisions in terms of mobilizing troops or mobilizing help in the event of a disaster. So again, we're not collecting this from the device. This comes directly from the social network, telling us that this person with this device posted from within that region or that bounding box. This takes us to another piece of really interesting information. A lot of activity going on in the war. Initially, the knee-jerk reaction is, let's collect everything we can around tanks and troops and what's being bombed and targeted. And that's great and that's absolutely important. But when we started to kind of take a look at the data in a different way, leveraging transforms, we actually discovered a completely different narrative going on. And that narrative involved places of worship. So we found that churches, synagogues, mosques across the Ukraine were being destroyed as troops moved through those areas. So if we set aside all the data around what we knew about the troop movements and military equipment and things like that, we also started to see some very important trends of all of these places of worship being destroyed. We would not have seen that had it not been for some of the automation we'll talk about next, which is why now with you know, the invent of AI, chat GPT, co-pilot and those things, that you can now have a right hand virtual person, if you will, to have you or have them look at it in a completely different way. And this is how we found this very important artifact. Why is that important? Well, as we started to map this out, you could use something as simple as Google Maps if you wanted to. You could go in here and plot these on a map. And in addition, with the automation, you can also include the initial post or tweet or whatever, and in addition, that image. So now as you start to bring this intelligence together, if you want to look at it on a map, you can start to see, in this case, all the places of worship that unfortunately have been destroyed during the war. And if you start to now look at, the lo look at that chronolocationally or a chronological timeline by location, there's some very important predictions you can make here about where they might target next. We did that and we found out we were 100% spot on. Not by tracking the tanks, not by tracking the troops, but by tracking the churches, synagogues and mosques, all these places of worship that were actually being destroyed. So we take all that data and then plot that on a map, the captured image, the tweet or the post if it's from a so another social network. And what we found is as we start to go through this, we then said, okay, we have another whole um, you know, lump of data here around troop movement and tanks. We'll plot all that on a map too. And you can do layers, you can do layers within Google Maps to help layer that or look at that data individually by type. So here we mapped all the tanks. These were some of the tanks with the same serial numbers that we saw at different locations at different points in time. So what's going on with this particular one? The first one you'll see the tank here just, out, just outside Kiev. 
But if you then look at the next tank, it's heading towards the area of Donetsk. What we learn later is that attacks from the Russians then occurred, you know, from the Donetsk region, from uh, the water, from the west side of the country. And basically what we're able to predict is that a lot of this military, once it had targeted Kiev, started to move in the direction of, of Donetsk. And we also started to see movement from the water hitting land targeting Donetsk. Bottom line, all of this military equipment and troops were converging on Donetsk. This tank that we show here is that, that piece of military equipment we showed earlier with that serial number B-23. And we showed it first next to Kiev, then moving towards Donetsk, and then further, you know, closer to Donetsk. So you could leverage Twitter for this and some other social networks. If you go, for example, to Discord, there are some amazing servers out there with a ton of information around the war. As I mentioned, some people are just passionate about um, planes or tanks or you name it. So there is a wealth of data out there that we leverage with this to you know, cross-correlate the data we're getting from multiple social networks. Again, whether it be leveraging the APIs or doing this within the terms of service. What was really cool about that then is as we start to merge that data on a Google map, we can basically enable all of those layers to now look at this in the context of everything going on, whether it be military equipment, troops, churches and places of worship being destroyed, and many of the other activities by different categorizations. This definitely starts to build out a storyline chronologically to help understand what might happen next as we showed with that piece of military equipment. There's a lot of different ways you can dashboard this. And this can be very helpful for an analyst. There are lots of either free tools or free trial tools you could use. In this particular case, I used Power BI. We took all the data and with an Azure Logic app, fed this automatically into Power BI. Initially, I created all these dashboards for all this data. Why is this important? Well, over on the far right, you'll see a filter. This filter allows you to search against the data. You can either automate that, or if an analyst needs to investigate something, for example, the serial number of that military equipment, or mentions, or other things that are going on, it gives you full sorting capability built right into the tool. In addition to this, you can also filter the tweets, filter things by emojis. There's a wealth of things you can do with this. Now, with things like Copilot or other things, is the ability to say, hey, I want to incorporate some prompt engineering. I want to ask it some questions. And when I do, I want to say, hey, build me a dashboard based on the intelligence you're seeing and it'll build another tab with that additional intelligence from a completely different viewpoint, giving you other analytics and data points you didn't even think to look for. So when you start to map it out in this way, and you know, a lot of these tools even have a free trial, you can go in there and leverage these to get some really cool, actionable, and very short timeline type data. There's also a plethora of widgets you know, built into a lot of these tools. What I had used within Power BI allowed me to not only do a, a lot of the mapping with ArcGIS, um, which is fed by URSA, I believe, um, but also other forms of word, widgets like WordCloud. This became really informative too because based on the data, there was a whole bunch of different keywords that popped up. So I can see a variety of things there. The, obviously a popular, you know, used word in Ukrainian and Russian. And then you start to look at some of this other data. When I started to take a look at the top 10 words, one of the ones that popped up was Oblast, which I believe is a, a region within Kiev. I had no idea that things were going on at that point in time within Kiev, but this actually told me that through the word cloud, through the widget, through all this active data. So again, another data point I would not have looked at by doing human analysis of all of this, but leveraging the widget and the automation in your favorite dashboarding, whether it be Grafana, whether it be Power BI, whether it be whatever, name your tool.
So then we start to get into extrapolation and prediction. We've already got some really interesting data points that we didn't even think to look for. But with the automation, with a lot of different perspectives, with the AI, with chat, GPT, with prompt engineering, we got a lot of additional very helpful data and got that in a very timely manner. The data is automatically feeding into it and analysts can be right there doing searches, creating reports and getting that data on demand. So as I mentioned, we're able to track some of the Russian uh, troop movements based on the data we collected. Um, and in addition, uh, we also found, you know, certain areas, as I mentioned, places of worship that were being destroyed, location, the time at which things were occurring, and other interesting data points. The question here then was, if I look specifically at these places of worship being destroyed, can I predict where the troops might be next? So if I'm on the defense or counter, I, and I need to figure out where to mobilize my teams, we were able to actually use this data to do a variety of prediction. Up at the top, you can see uh, Cherkinev, and before that, we actually had Kikarev, where the troops were moving based on the chronological timeline, and we could see they were moving closer and closer to Kiev. It was pretty much expected they were gonna target Kiev, but these data points prove that, and it gave us some really interesting data points to actually say, yep, they're on the move, they're all converging on Kiev. Then you'll see a splinter of, you know, um, some troops in a completely different direction up one of the main highways in the easterly direction. And we showed you earlier where some of the other troops splintered off and started going towards Donetsk, where they also converged. So a lot of this data definitely can be used for predictive extrapolation type of analysis, and we proved it but we would not have known to look at just places of worship to get that data. So the automation, the prompt engineering, and a lot of these things are what actually got our laser focus on some of these other areas we weren't focused on. So a lot of us are starting to mess around with things like chat GPT. And what's kind of nice about it is a lot of vendors have taken this and basically isolated it in a tenant for you so that you're running it only against your data and not exposing that data or that analysis to the external world. This prompt engineering, as I mentioned, can allow you to put in a variety of different prompts to look at just this data in a lot of unique ways. Tell me what are the top trends we're seeing at this point in time? What are they? Are they places of worship? Are they troop movements? Are they posts from uh, people that are suffering damage and need help uh, you know, on the ground within this geolocation, within this bounding box? Through this, we basically said, let me go ahead and put in a variety of questions, and then once I got this honed in on what I want, I basically can say, build me a dashboard. So whereas the previous dashboard I had was built manually by myself, I can now have the AI and the automation build it for me. And when it did, it looked completely different. And that was really cool. So we have that as a second tab, looking all, all of this data in a different transform in a different way. Bottom line, it helped us identify a plethora of things we had missed. So how can we use this methodology? It can be applied to not only war, but disaster response. There are a lot of organizations that want to know, hey, we're having all of these California rains. There are dams building up with water. People are starting to post that the water is going over the dam and destroying some homes. Also help us you know, find people in need within that geo-bounding box of that region that we weren't focused on. Someone just you know, posted a, um, uh, something about their home being destroyed and there's a bunch of flooding from a river that overflowed or the things that were going on in Sacramento. So this will obviously give you a variety of really interesting data points to help with the situational awareness and mobilization of help for these individuals. Another thing that we frequently do is the account profiling. As I mentioned, we basically whittle this down so that 50% of the data we're getting are from the top 10 to 20 um, people that are posting on that social network. 
versus the whole gamut of that entire region. That provides us about 50% of the data and also helps us further weed out misinformation and disinformation because we also profile those accounts that are spreading misinformation or disinformation and profile those top 10 accounts as well so we can say exclude that data, I don't even want that included with it. So I hope you found this talk informative. I'll hang out for a little bit if you have any questions about this. Happy to chat about it. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we spent a few years. If you're interested in a copy of the research report, it's available at our site um, listed there, silentsignals.com. You can download it for free and see um, a deeper analysis around the research report. It's free. And we also are looking for people at any time that may want to get involved with the research. Uh, so if you are interested, we have an email there. And then we also have our Twitter account where we post some of the latest information around some of our research. So thanks so much for your time today. I hope you enjoyed it. Mike Rago, everyone. Mike. So um, if you have a question for Mike, uh, yeah, we can hang out here. We got time. Um, I don't think you need to use a microphone, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, tomorrow we will have two more talks sponsored by the, uh, presented by the Packet Hacking Village in the afternoon. So. I'll ask him a question. Thank you again. I've got a question. What uh, level of Twitter API are we using to gather your data? Uh, uh, can you clarify? I'm sorry, I caught the part around well, the Twitter like API. a free version. It's limited. There's like a $5,000 a month. Firehose version. Yeah, um, the last um, that we were, you know, doing our, you know, updates related to it, there were multiple tiers. Um, so the free versus the other three tiers. There's like, don't quote me on this, and it may have changed again. But there was basic. Um, I forget the middle one, and then like enterprise. The basic, I believe, the last I checked was $100, $100 a, month. a month. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what we've used, gotcha. and we've gotten like a wealth of data. Yep, yep. But we did have to move from free to a paid version. But the basic did give us a, a wealth of data. Y if you um, go on the uh, Tweepy API website, it'll list out the different tiers for you in different tabs, so you can ex see exactly what APIs are available. Yep. Good question. Well, I'll hang out for a few more minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to, to uh, use the mic or if you want to come up and chat um, privately, that's fine too. And uh, thanks again. Hope you enjoy the show.